Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our seminar series. I'm Gabriele Lignani, and I'm co-chairing this uh, series with Dimitri Kuhlman here. Hi. And today is a pleasure to have with us uh, Ivan Soltes. And um, just to remind you, you can ask questions in the Q&A uh, tab on the bottom here. And we will try to, to make it more interactive. So we will try to, to give you the, the the, the possibility to speak and ask and ask uh, ask a questions directly to Ivan, but if you don't want, we can read uh, your questions from the Q and A. So, I will briefly introduce Ivan. So, Ivan received his uh, doctorate in uh, his PhD in Budapest, and is conducted postdoctoral research uh, at different universities in Oxford, London, Stanford, and Dallas. And this, he established his laboratory at the University of California, Irvine, in 1995. And then he became a full professor in, in uh, 2003 and serves as department, uh, the department chair from 2006 uh, to 2015. Then he returned back to Stanford in 2015 uh, as the James Doty Professor of Neurosurgery and Neurosciences at the Stanford University School of Medicine. As you may know, his ma major research interest is focused on neuronal microcircuits, network oscillations, cannabinoid signaling, and the mechanistic basis of circuit dysfunction in epilepsy. Indeed, today's seminar is about organization control of hippocampal circuits in epilepsy. So it's, it's a very pleasure to have you with us, Ivan. And if you want to start. Uh, Thank uh, you so much. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Um, and uh, hang on, let me put this on. Okay, and the pointer. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss some of our recent uh, results here. Um, I haven't, actually this is a completely new talk so um, I'll probably be going a bit uh, slower than normal, but um, I really hope that you guys will ask questions um, and uh, that you will have fun. So without further ado, so uh, we all know that the GABAergic system uh, is really important in epilepsy. So um, most research focuses on uh, the types of cells that we can access genetically. So the fast packing probably positive cells are quite numerous and they are the, these cells shown here, the exoxonic cells that go into the initial segment of principal cells, the basket cells that go into the perisomatic region of pyramidal cells, and then the dendritically projecting PV cells. In addition to the PV cells, there has been a lot of research done on somatostatin and NPY uh, positive uh, cells that are uh, in general innervate the dendritic regions. Now, the PV cells and, uh, and about half of the somatostatin and NPY cells are derived from one part uh, of the uh, uh, embryonic brain called the MGE, uh, the, uh, the medial uh, uh, geniculate uh, eminences, uh, or the CGE. And the CGE-derived cells are, uh, again, some of them are the uh, somatostatin and the NPY cells, but many of them actually, from number seven to number 11 here, are cells that express uh, CCK or cholecystokinin. And you can see that CCK cells um, are actually quite numerous uh, in the circuit. Um, they are actually more numerous than the somatostatin cells, but virtually nothing has been known about them in the behaving animal. And uh, the main reason for this is simply that there was no good genetic access to them. And it's very hard to actually hunt for them blind with juxta cell electrode and hope that you hit one. So, um, so anyway, so let me then uh, just say upright that I'm not going to upfront, I'm not going to focus on many of these types. I'll be really focusing on one type, 
name, namely this guy here, uh, the CCK positive basket cells. But let me first show you what has been known for some time about the perisomatic inhibitory system uh, of all cortical circuits. I'd be, of course, focusing on my favorite brain area, the hippocampus, but very similar organizational principles are there also for uh, basically all cortical uh, networks. So, so the perisomatic inhibitory system is um, either coming from the parvobumin positive basket cells or the, the cholecystokinin positive uh, cells. The parvobumin positive cells receive a lot of excitatory input and this will become, as you will see, quite important uh, um, when we look um, a little bit under the hood. Um, these cells uh, fire very fast action potentials that are non-accommodating, meaning that in response to a sustained depolarization, they continue to fire with little accommodation. And then when they, when they release GABA at the business end onto the pyramidal cell, uh, cell body or the proximal dendrites, uh, the postsynaptic GABA current that you can record, shown in uh, purple here, are very closely timed uh, in time, very closely coupled in time to the presynaptic action potential. So we call this synchronous release. Um, and in contrast, the CCK cells receive relatively little excitatory inputs. They fire accommodating and slower action potentials in general. And uh, when they release GABA, their GABA release in general is more asynchronous. It's less, less precisely uh, coupled to the presynaptic uh, action potential in time. Now, they also have a whole variety of um, uh, various molecules that they express that are different between these two. Uh, for example, the calcium channel that is responsible for the release of GABA um, is different in the case of the PV cells, it's PQ, whereas the, uh, in the case of the C CCK cells uh, is N-type channels. Um, and in addition to, to that, there are numerous differences in the types of modulatory receptors that they express. And one of the most prominent one is the CB1 receptor that we are going to get back um, at the second part of the talk. Um, you will hear uh, basically about two things today, uh, one of which is just published, um, that's the CCK basket cell story. The other one that is uh, not yet published. Um, now, the first one, the CCK basket cells, I believe that they are really, really important for us to understand if we are going to really have a mechanistic understanding of what goes on in a, in a, a cortical circuit in a chronic epilepsy, just because, as I said, they are numerically quite um, abundant and we have basically zero idea of what they do in vivo. And what I hope to show you is really a vision of how the parvobumin and CCK cells uh, actually together form a complementary inhibitory system that regulate uh, excitability under normal conditions. And with the tools that we'll be discussing, we can actually now really transition into looking at what happens in, um, when epilepsy develops. In the second part of the talk, uh, we'll talk about endocannabinoids uh, that activate those uh, CB1 receptors on the CCK cells. And uh, you will see that endocannabinoid transmission uh, or regulation of GABA release and glutamate release, I believe uh, uh, is, is really, really important in regulating the level of activity in the network. As you can already see from the, um, from the slide, the first one, the primary actor there um, was Barna Dudok, an excellent postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Um, and Jordan Farrell was responsible uh, for the endocannabinoid story. But as we go along, I'll mention, uh, hopefully I won't forget all the other people who have contributed both in terms of faculty from other institutions as well as postdoctoral fellows uh, in my lab and elsewhere. So we, without further ado, let's jump into the uh, first part of the talk. So for those of you who don't know this, um, let me mention that 
you know, sometimes we wonder whether there was sufficient, uh, you know, advance in science, but just as an illustration for the, for the students in the audience, let me just mention, this was actually my first paper. Um, the, uh, that was in 1986, and it was on the um, description of CCK positive cells in the visual cortex of the cat. They basically chained me to a microscope in Budapest, uh, like Mozart was changed to a, a piano. Uh, it's unpleasant, but it's good education. And uh, basically what you can do with a camera lucida shown up there, uh, is that you can trace these axons and the dendritic structure of these cells. And uh, you can find that, for example, many of them surround somata, that therefore many of them are basket cells. But that was really all that was known at the, at, at the time. This was a, a big discovery um, in, the, in the field of understanding gobergic circuits, but, but really the field has not moved forward in terms of our understanding of what goes on in vivo with, in the behaving animal with, animals with these cells. Now, one reason for that is um, that it was very, it is still very difficult to gain genetic access to them. So just as an illustration here, this is a work from Barna. Um, and what you can see here is you may think that, oh, I just use CCK Cree line, for example, and they'll look, um, you know, use that as, as an access. The problem with it is that CCK and actually CB1 as well at low levels is expressed also in the pyramidal cells. So it's not a good strategy to use just let's say CCK Cree line uh, because you are going to have uh, your, for example, opsin or calcium indicator or whatever also in the pyramidal cells. Now you might say that while well, I'm going to then use an intersectional approach where I use the CCK Cree line in combination, for example, with the gobergic line like a DLX flex and then uh, you know I should be luckier indeed when you look in the microscope you see that many of the cells now look more like you would hope for um, interneuron like scattered cells however when you look closer with immunocytochemistry and use pro CCK um, as your marker uh, and and then you also check for other markers what you see is for example in this CCK Cree DLX line that I just mentioned on the top, uh, you see that pro CCK actually is expressed only in a tiny proportion of the cells, even with this intersectional approach. And similarly, uh, if you use another line like HDR3A Cree line, which is um, in general marker for many of the CGAE derived neurons, and again, you use some kind of a, a, other approach, again, you are not very much better off. You are still below 10% in hit rate. Now, what you could do, and Warner has started do, uh, had started with this in his project, is to actually really bite the bullet and use a general uh, marker. You know, let's say what, the HDR3A marker, knowing by general I mean you know that it's not perfect. But what you do is that you do your recordings, and then post hoc you cut your, uh, your, the brain up, and then you find the right cell in the histological section, and then you do your uh, immunocytochemistry for pro CCK. So therefore, you know that this cell uh, that was labeled uh, and you recorded its activity was indeed pro CCK, whereas this one was not. It's probably parvovulin cell. So, this approach, of course, is good, but the problem is it's extremely labor intensive. Now, a little an advance on this, if you actually, um, instead of resectioning physically, you essentially do tissue clearing and immunostaining after you did your recordings. And then um, you uh, then uh, do basically the resectioning optically. And that works, but again, even with this technique, it's quite labor intensive. And this particular technique, of course, takes time. So, and I was just mentioning this uh, at the beginning uh, when we were discussing uh, the world affairs with uh, Dimitri and Gabriel, um, that these Zoom talks are very nice, but what is missing really from them is the interpersonal interactions. And just as an aside, let me mention that all of these uh, projects that I'm talking about today, they all started um, as a result of 
just chatting to people at conferences. So that is really important. But moving on, so I uh, so basically interactions, um, you know, uh, between uh, my lab and uh, the Allen Brain Institute, uh, Hong Kong Yizang and uh, uh, Tanya Beagle and, and others um, have led to this um, breakthrough um, in the field, which is the recognition that based on RNA-seq, it uh, turns out that this gene, the gamma synuclein gene, SNCG gene, um, um, you can get a mouse line. Uh, it's, a, it, it's generated, of course, in the, in the Allen Bain Institute, the SNCG flip line uh, that specifically labels the CB1 CCK basket cells as Borna has found. So when you look uh, under the hood with this uh, viral construct, um, and you, what you see here is that the, um, these green cells that are labeled are all pro-CCK uh, positive, almost all of them. It's, uh, it's really specific. And they are also expressing CB1 receptors um, on, their, on their exon terminals. Uh, whereas the, there is only a tiny proportion, basically negligible amount of um, PV uh, positivity in, in this mouse line. So this is really exciting. I mean, as I showed you, 1986 was the time when I published my first paper on CCK cells. That was really the first paper on CCK basket cells. And, you know, it took the field a long time, uh, but we got there, right? We got there. So um, the, um, when we went and really tried to confirm the, these observations uh, with, for example, with physiology, as hoped, uh, indeed, the cells that you can patch in this SNCG mouse line show this, deep, um, this uh, accommodating action potential pattern, um, and uh, the uh, axons are uh, mostly in the soma, so perisomatic uh, region in the pyramidal layer in the CA1, and they express pro-CCK, as I already mentioned, and, in, and you can also show the CB1 immunoreactivity. And when, uh, when our, our colleagues at the Allen Brain Institute did um, uh, patch seek on these cells, um, you can see the uh, pipeline. Uh, it very nicely came up that most of the cells belong to one, um, one kind of family of SNCG cells but it's not completely um, uh, homogeneous. There is some variations in what type of other genes they may express, but they all express, for example, the CB1 receptors or the CCK. Now, do these, so, so now we can ask the question, just let's verify that what we learned from decades of work uh, on slice, from slice work where People, our lab and other labs, we have la labor intensively, tried to patch either single cells or pairs of cells and looked at the transmission. So we learned a lot from uh, how these cells operated in vitro. Um, what you could see is that indeed, uh, when for example, you flash the light and you record from a, a pyramidal cell uh, and you activate uh, child rhodopsin in these interneurons, what you see is IPSC sequences that uh, resemble what you would expect from the presynaptic firing pattern that, as I mentioned, is accommodating. Um, furthermore, if you record uh, again from a pyramidal cell and you flash uh, the light on, and every now and then you depolarize your pyramidal cell, and this, we'll get back to that, what's going to happen then uh, that's, that's our understanding, is that when you depolarize your pyramid, postsynaptic pyramidal cell, uh, calcium comes in and endocannabinoids get released and they go to the presynaptic CB1 receptors and shut down further GABA release from the CCK positive um, uh, GABA cells. So this phenomenon is called depolarization induced suppression of inhibition. And indeed, when you flash your light, uh, if the light flash is uh, the activation of the SNCG CCK CB1 interneurons um, is preceded by a uh, depolarization of the pyramidal cell. So presumably you released your endocannabinoids. You see that the IPSC size, the amplitude of the IPSCs is shut down. Um, exactly what we uh, knew would happen uh, from 
uh, the uh, from slice work. Um, and this is all in vitro. So now we can um, not, now we can transition to in vivo work. Uh, let's see whether they inhibit pyramidal cells, which would be expected. And indeed, if you do um, multi-unit recordings of, of presumed uh, putative pyramidal cells in the CA1 in mice, uh, and you activate childropsin in, the, in these uh, CCK basket cells labeled by this line, you see that the pyramidal cell firing is um, very strongly depressed. And actually, there is no significant overshoot uh, upon the cessation of the uh, inhibition. So there is no rebound spiking. So with this tool, then, we can now start asking the question of what is it that these cells do? So just so that you, um, again, for the students, that they understand why this is a, a big deal, at least for people like me interested in the nuances of the GABAergic system and understanding how they may change in epilepsy. Um, so. Altogether, I believe there are about maybe seven or eight cells that have been filled uh, in the anesthetized animals when published. Um, this was uh, by uh, Klaus Berger and Peter Shamoji. And, um, you know, and basically there, there is almost nothing known about how they behave, uh, you know, in the awake behaving animals. So now we can do this. Now let's see what actually happens. And as I hope to convince you in the next few slides, this has big implications, not just for understanding this particular class of interneurons, but broader implications about how inhibition is organized in cortical networks. So what you see here is basically double uh, labeling uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the animal, uh, where we simultaneously, we meaning Barna, simultaneously imaged um, the, uh, the uh, either the uh, uh, SSCG cells or the PV cells. And what you see is that when the animal is running here, this is, the, this is time, and you see that the shaded area here is when the animal is, when the animal is running. And what you see is that the PV cells uh, start to fire when the animal is running, this is known, and then they decline their activity when the animal stops. So this is shown here, when the animal starts to run, you see the PV cell activity going up, and when the animal stops, the activity declines uh, over uh, a few seconds. Now notice what, and, and the other thing that you can also observe perhaps is that when there is a sharp wave ripple, these are synchronous events associated with episodic memory recall in the hippocampus, uh, triggered essentially by a barrage of input from the CA3 and the CA1 pyramidal cells and the, and the PV cells start to fire. So these cells are known to be activated. And indeed, you see that during sharp wave ripples, the PV cells uh, get activated. Uh, now notice what happens though to the uh, CCK basket cells. They do exactly the opposite. You can see this. When the animal starts to run, the activity goes down. That's what you see here on the SNCG activity. And when the animal stops, when the PV cells, and by the way, also the pyramidal cell activity declines. Um, so the animal stops, and then the CCK cell activity goes up. And uh, the sharp wave ripple uh, activity is also like that. The PV cells go up, then the CCK cells go down, and you can see the same thing happening. Also, um, hang on a second, I need to move my little screen here. Um, so, um, so you can see that the same thing is happening um, during the, um, during the uh, face movements during immobility. So facial movements of the animal uh, during immobility. Hang on a little bit. I have to arrange my screen here a little bit. I apologize. OK, here we go. So the point here is that as the title of the slide says, the PV and interneurons are differentially recruited um, during brain state transitions in the behaving animal during spontaneous uh, behaviors. In fact, is so um, almost perfect mirror image, the, uh, the two cell populations are perfect mirror images of each other to the degree that you can actually use 
the PV activity to predict if you uh, build a uh, linear uh, model like Borna did, you can actually uh, predict extremely well the uh, activity of the CCK cells just from the PV cells. Um, and if you add a little bit of delay between them, it gets tiny bit better. And this is true also for during running and in mobility. So the general point is that whenever PV cells are up, CCKs are down and they alternate, right? As we have seen. And so you can see, you can actually use the PV interior activity as a very good predictor of the SNCG activity. Why is that? Why is it that when the PV cell and pyramidal cell activity is high and the CCK activity is low, could it be that the PV interneurons are actively inhibiting the SNCG interneurons? And when Borna looked closer, first with anatomy, uh, indeed he found that the SNCG positive boutons were in close uh, uh, juxtaposition on the uh, PV positive, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, is the, uh, the other way around, that the uh, PV positive boutons were in ju a close juxtaposition on the SNCG cells, right? So the PV basket cells, in addition to innervating the pyramidal cells, as well as each other, which has been known for a long time, that leads to all kinds of interesting synchronization phenomena, they also innervate um, the uh, CCK basket cells. Indeed, when you flash light um, in this mouse line, if you put chalorodopsin into the, into the PV cells in the presence of uh, glutamate receptor antagonists in slices and record from SNCG cells, you see that you can, uh, you can record nice IPSPs, IPSCs. Um, so the PV cell activation locally uh, can inhibit the CCK basket cells. Now, does it happen in vivo? And indeed it does. So if you express a chalodopsin again in PV cells, and um, whenever you flash the light um, and you record the activity of the SNCG cells, you see that the normally present rise in activity following the stoppage of the animal. So when the locomotion stops, as I said, the SNCG CCK cell activity goes up. But if you flash the light and inhibit, uh, sorry, and excite the PV cells, then this activation doesn't happen. So again, uh, the conclusion is that PV interneurons indeed inhibit these SNCG interneurons. And this may explain uh, the, uh, this uh, really counterpoint-like behavior between these two major inhibitory, perisomatic inhibitory uh, neurons. Now, this is just the same point here, but now we look at it, not just in terms of PV and CCK, but let's separate them and uh, for a moment. And let's look at now the SNCG neurons. You see this in, in this light blue, and you see all neurons in the field of view um, here um, with a synapse in uh, uh, JR gecko. Uh, shown in black, you see that the all neurons, of course, most of them are, those are pyramidal cells. When the animal runs, their activity goes up. You see that in both cases. When you then look at the SNCG cells, you see that the SNCG cell activity is mirroring um, uh, the uh, activity of all neurons and pyramidal cells, whereas the PV interneurons are faithfully following the activity of the uh, the, the net, um, or if you want, average activity of, the, of that circuit. So the PV cells, remember at the beginning, uh, we talked about how they receive a lot of excitatory input, both from incoming afferents as well as from local CA1 pyramids. So they sample always the activity that's present in the network. They are very attuned to that. And in fact, they scale very well, as you will see in the next slide, to, to actually follow that activity. Whereas the SNCG cells are doing exactly the opposite, maybe because the PV interneurons inhibit them. So let's now um, look at it uh, from a, uh, this exact same data set as I showed you here in the previous slide, uh, but now let's quantify it. And basically the question that Borno asked, which I thought was excellent, let's start with the PV cells, that's probably easier to understand. 
Um, let's look at the all neurons. Again, that's basically the pyramidal cell activity. Um, even when, the, when the activity of the pyramidal cells is very low, so you rank the activity of, the, of all neurons from, in the field of view from minimal to maximal. Uh, so you just, you just bin it and then you basically as you rank them uh, and you sort them accordingly uh, the, so that when the normalized activity in all neurons uh, is low, then the PV cell activity shown in this uh, color here, um, this um, reddish color, you see that um, the PV cell activity is also low. And by the naked eye, you can see that here, right? Uh, and then uh, when the uh, activity in the network is very high, maximal, you see that the activity of the PV cell is also maximal. Notice, however, that that's exactly the opposite to what happens to the SNCG cells. When the activity of the cells of the net, the net network activity is low, the SNCG activity is high and vice versa. Uh, now, just one last point about this. If you then now focus only on the cells that actually do the coding at any moment in time, so you focus your attention not to all cells, but to exclusively on the place cells that you can see. So here the animal is running uh, on a circular treadmill. And you can see that, for example, this cell is active at this position always in the, uh, in, on the treadmill. So these are called place cells from zero to several hundred. And now you restrict your analysis to that. You find exactly the same thing. Uh, so whenever the place cell activity is high, when the animal is running, uh, the CCK cell, SNCG cell activity is low, an animal stops, this goes up, that comes down. And again, if you look closely to this data set, what you find is if you now, for example, rank order them as a function of the SNCG activity. So when the, uh, baskets, the CCK basket cell activity is low, the network is very active. And when the basket cell activity is high, the network is not very active. And that's um, if you compare them again to the PV cell activity in other experiments, you can see that again, the PV cells basically behave just like the um, place cells, right? Because they are so tuned to what happens to the uh, pyramidal cells that are active. So they really track that activity uh, very well. Uh, so let's conclude therefore this first part that the CA1 CCK basket cells are selectively labeled in this mouse line, giving us an opportunity to study them both under control condition, which I showed here, because that's where that's what we finished. The, the experiments on what happens in epilepsy uh, are undergoing. Um, and I'll be happy to talk about it maybe in a year or so. So the complementary, so therefore there is a complementary perisomatic inhibitory system consisting of CCK and PV interneurons that are active at distinct times in an alternating fashion during spontaneous behaviors. CCK basket cell activity inversely scales with the activity or the strength of inputs if you want. So when the strength of inputs, the average activity is low, uh, the uh, pyramidal cells of course are not going to fire much. As the activity is uh, going up, the pyramidal cells in black is going, uh, are going to fire more and the PV cells are nicely tracking this. And you can see that the CCK cells are doing exactly the opposite. Um, and that we showed that the PV to CCK inhibition is a key control element. Now I just wanna pause here uh, for just 30 seconds or so and just, just show you that, uh, or like just step out a little bit and let's think about this a little bit. So if you, if you would ask the question, what do you think an uh, inhibitory system should look like? Um, you know, it's a little bit like the more you step on the brake, right? The more your inhibitory system is active, you would expect that the network, if the inhibition is really good, should be low. So curiously, the CCK cells are, be, are actually behaving according to that logic. Whereas the PV cells in a way are a system, they comprise of an inhibitory system that are as active as the, as the average network. They track that, right? So they scale linearly uh, with the average activity. But to me, it's very interesting that 
these data reveal that there can be a completely differently organized inhibitory system that are just doing the opposite. Um, and it's, to me, it will be a major question, for, excuse me, for the coming years to understand what happens in different types of epilepsy models uh, to, this, um, to this, what we call <clears throat> with Barnard, this X-shaped regulation of inhibition, of perisomatic inhibition, um, and to understand that, for example, in epilepsy, um, in chronic epilepsy, what happens to this scaling? Is it that the CCK cells, for example, will be more like flat or they will become like the PV cells or what happens? We don't know. So that's going to be, I think, very exciting to find out. And I personally, I like this picture that is shown on the bottom right here is because it's, it's, it's relatively simple uh, and, and it's measurable. And don't forget, we are not focusing on one particular behavioral state. This is what the animal is just doing, it's spontaneous behavior. And then we measure the average activities uh, and, and rank order them. Um, so that's basically uh, what I wanted to say uh, in the first part. So um, let's move now uh, on to the other part. So I have probably about uh, 10 more minutes or so, so I'm going to skip some of them. Uh, but um, let me just say that this one is really on the endocannabinoid system, as I mentioned. And I need to give a little background here, and I think this is super interesting as well. So um, I'm not going to rush through it. I'm just going to still explain it to you so that people can follow the rest of the talk. So. This is about uh, the endocannabinoid signaling. Endocannabinoids are lipids um, that are uh, actually have been disregarded in biology for a long time, right? I mean, we all learn about nucleic acids and proteins in biology, not so much about lipids, but actually the, the brain by dry weight is mostly lipids. Um, and what the field has found in general, starting in the 90s, that um, these cannabinoids seem to be, the endocannabinoids, are activity dependently uh, synthesized. So for example, um, when calcium is uh, rising intracellularly, they can be activated, or when metabotopic glutamate receptors uh, at the perisynapse are activated as a result probably of uh, glutamate spillover from excitatory um, uh, synapses, uh, then they trigger a biochemical cascade at least to the synthesis and release of these endocannabinoids. Uh, and that the idea is that these lipids then cross the synaptic cleft and they um, activate CB1 receptors on excitatory and inhibitory terminals uh, and block further glutamate and GABA release. So basically these CB1 receptors are uh, inhibitory G protein coupled receptors and they um, inhibit uh, anti-calcium channels, which as I mentioned, are expressed in these CB1 containing uh, CCK uh, basket cells. So, um, so it's activity dependent, uh, synthesis and uh, release. This is all based on slice work and biochemical studies. Um, and the effect is inhibition of glutamate and GABA release. A CB1 receptor expression is extremely high. I should say it's actually the highest uh, expressed G protein coupled receptor in the brain, um, but it's very cell type specific. It's on certain excitatory terminals. And as I uh, mentioned, on certain types of interneurons, the CCK interneurons. Uh, and you can see that the, that the synthetic apparatus for synthesizing these endocannabinoids are at the perisynapse, as I mentioned, mGluR5, uh, phospholipase C beta and the DAG lipase, the diacylglycerol lipase alpha are involved in the synthesis. And what we don't know though, really, is how, you know, for example, you saw those, um, the activity of the place cells, would an activity like that be able to, so normal physiological activity, would it actually lead to the synthesis and um, uh, and uh, release of these uh, compounds. Uh, what precisely the, is the nature of these compounds? What type of lipids are they? The two suspects, as you will see soon, are 2-AG and anandamide. Um, and in general, for example, if uh, how is the activity in one pyramidal cell um, 
or coupled to the um, to the cannabinoid uh, release in that uh, pyramidal cell. What happens during seizures, right? Uh, is there spatial specificity of this signaling and how is that broken down? None of this could be uh, studied in vivo. And the major reason for that is that we don't have a good, um, good way of tracking these lipids, these activity dependently synthesized um, and released lipids in vivo. I'm going to skip this and I just mentioned that of course there's huge interest in in many areas of neuroscience in cannabis related activation or, or um, uh, cannabis related uh, biology, uh, because of course it's uh, cannabis and marijuana is, is in global use and has moved towards legalization in virtually every country. And THC and CBD, many of you, if you're interested in epilepsy, of course you heard about them. Let me just say that THC is a weak partial agonist. Um, and CBD is acting on many things, but it can also modulate certain uh, CB1 agonist effects through various mechanisms. And uh, I would just say that the CB1 receptor is expressed very highly in critically important brain areas uh, associated with reward habit and cognitive related circuits. And as a result, Many, many uh, scientists and companies have been trying to develop cannabinoid-based therapies to a whole slew of uh, disorders, including epilepsy. Um, and uh, many of you have heard about uh, this, that uh, for, for childhood epilepsies, a CBD, cannabidiol, uh, has been uh, thought to be quite promising. And indeed, uh, uh, 2017, um, a, a placebo-controlled trial, double-blind trial came out and showed that indeed CBD works on Drave. Uh, and therefore, then shortly after that, 2018, the FDA approved uh, the first uh, purified uh, drug substance from marijuana, CBD. And I should mention too, though, that the, one of the reasons why we have to, as basic scientists interested in epilepsy, really focus on what happens in vivo is because we know that CB1 signaling, for example, plays key roles in development. And you can see the uh, references there if you want, you can follow it up. It's a very intricate signaling system where the various enzymes involved in cannabinoid synthesis and breakdown is, is positioned in interesting ways on the growth cones and the exons. Um, so I have been trying to get a way of looking at the endocannabinoid signaling in vivo for a long time. And um, luckily, uh, Yu Long Li uh, at Peking University uh, and his super postdoc, Ao uh, Dong, you see their uh, pictures there, uh, they have collaborated with us and developed a very interesting, uh, very promising uh, sensor, um, a tool, if you want, a molecular tool uh, that basically um, can detect in vivo uh, cannabinoid uh, molecules binding to the to them. And this basically this this is a modified human CB1 receptor uh, where they basically uh, chopped off the business end, the GTP, uh, the G protein signaling end. Of the, um, of the receptor and attach the, um, an EGFP to it. And so that when the ligand, the lipid ligand binds to them, binds to this receptor, you get a fluorescent uh, signal. Uh, and they showed that you can apply either an endamide, which is, as I mentioned, one of the major uh, uh, endocannabinoid lipid compound in the brain, or, uh, and they can also apply 2-AG, you get a very nice signal. This is the dose response curve. And they have tried many other compounds like GABA or ACH and others, and you luckily don't get a, a signal. So this seems to be very specific to anandamide and 2-AG. It's actually a little bit more sensitive to anandamide, which is exactly what you, you would get if you study uh, native CB1 receptors. So now let's start to ask the questions that we asked. So question number one, uh, if you look like Jordan did um, in vivo using the signal, 
this, by the way, was in collaboration uh, with Barno uh, Dudok as well, um, as well as uh, several other people, um, of course, including um, Eo and uh, Yulong um, and other people. Um, so when they, did, when they were, again, putting the mouse on a circular treadmill and looking at the calcium and the um, ECB signal, um, what you can see, the calcium is uh, in, uh, I believe in this case, in, in every cell. Um, and what you can see is that every time the animal runs, you see that some cells um, um, show a calcium signal, which is, which is basically they are, those are the place cells. Um, and you can see that you can see in, the, in similar cells, in probably the same cells, you see an ECB signal as well. So therefore, this is the first indication that physiological activity, and we're just simply running. We are not doing anything unusual. The animal just simply starts to run. The calcium signal goes up and the ECB, the endocannabinoid signal also goes up. So that's great. Now let's try to identify what type of endocannabinoid that is. Is it the anandamide or that I mentioned in uh, two slides before, or is it 2-AG? It's very important for people in the field because it, these compounds, 2-AG and anandamide, they have their own dedicated synthesizing enzymes and um, metabolic enzymes, the enzymes that break them down. And uh, notice that 2-AG is being broken down to arachidonoic acid, which is something I'll come back in a minute. So when you record the uh, ECB signal in green um, and the calcium signal as before, I showed that in the previous slide, you can kind of by eye see that whenever, whenever the animal is running, you see that the calcium signal is leading the endocannabinoid signal a little bit. And these are in five and 10% um, DF over F. Now, if you use various pharmacological agents in vivo and try to see, well, if I mess around with either the synthesizing or the breakdown pathways of 2-AG, do I get a signal change in endocannabinoid responses? And indeed you do. So if you block with, with this drug, the uh, DEG lipase um, that synthesizes 2-AG, the endocannabinoid response is greatly uh, reduced. And if you then inhibit with this JZL compound the breakdown of 2-AG, you would expect that the endocannabinoid signal should go up. And indeed, that's what you see. The endocannabinoid signal is going up. In contrast, uh, when you mess around with the synthesis or breakdown of anandamide, nothing much happens. This is shown uh, in quantified form here. So therefore, during uh, physiological locomotion, it is 2-AG that get, gets uh, synthesized and uh, presumably released. Now, what happens during seizures, right? Uh, that's, of course, a major question because the, these endocannabinoids, as I mentioned, they are very good at inhibiting uh, glutamate and GABA release. Uh, there we know that from biochemical studies and also from electrophysiology made, uh, done in slices. Now, what you can see immediately is that if you do, if you evoke seizure activity, this is um, a kindling induced uh, electrographic seizure. Um, what you see is that there is a massively large signal. Uh, this is 200% uh, for both the um, calcium and the doconobinoid signal, which is much larger than normal under normal conditions, right? But again, the endocannabinoid and the calcium signal track each other very well. And uh, what you can see is that, again, when you modulate 2-AG synthesis and breakdown, uh, you can see that the endocannabinoid is modulated in the similar manner as during locomotion, whereas if you mess around with the anandamide um, synthesis or breakdown, uh, the endocannabinoid signal doesn't change. So that means that both during normal locomotion and during seizures, it is uh, AG that is involved, um, that gets synthesized. Now, I should mention something that I want to draw your attention to this. So uh, under normal conditions, so no drugs, notice that even though the signal, the endocannabinoid signal is massive compared to what you see during normal conditions, but even this signal is over within about a minute or so. 
Now, you, using, for example, conventional, very sensitive, but conventional biochemical techniques, if uh, that's what the field has been doing, trying to understand what happens to these signaling molecules, uh, for example, during seizures. Uh, the problem is that for, for example, mass spec, you need to, um, of course, sacrifice the animal, remove the brain and freeze it. And only then uh, you can do your study. So that's almost no way to remove the brain um, in like one minute and freeze it. So what this means is that most of those biochemical studies were working here at the tail end of this signal. That might explain a lot of the controversies that, uh, that have been published in this field. So going back to, the, to this signal, the other thing I want to actually say is that notice that when we inhibit uh, 2-AG synthesis, you would expect, of course, that because I said that endocannabinoids inhibit glutamate release, but glutamate release is the important thing here. So therefore, if you remove that inhibition, you are going to make the seizures worse. That's actually known. Um, uh, have been known for a while, and indeed we see that too. So uh, the uh, electrographic seizure duration is uh, is um, prolonged uh, with uh, with inhibition of the synthesis of synthesis. Now, um, how much time do I have? Do I have another five minutes? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Um, so let's look at look at it a little bit more, and that's what Jordan did in some very innovative uh, uh, analytical um, studies here. So let's now look at the temporal characteristics of the activity-dependent 2AG signaling. This has never been done before, so I'm personally really excited about this uh, because literally for 20 years I've been trying to actually see this um, and to be able to do that now in vivo, no less, is very exciting for me personally. So uh, when Jordan looked at it uh, closer, what he saw was that um, you can actually see it by shifting either backward or forward the calcium and the endocannabinoid signal. You can see that the, uh, that the endocannabinoid signal uh, lags behind the calcium signal on average by about a second, right? And furthermore, when you, I, I, during locomotion or during seizures, if you inhibit the breakdown of 2AG with JZL, you prolong this, uh, this temporal offset, which is exactly what you would expect. So this is the temporal characteristic of 2AG signaling. Now, what about the spatial characteristic? Since with the two photon, you can actually then really isolate one cell and ask the question, uh, is this coupling between the, um, this delayed coupling between the calcium and the uh, endocannabinoid signal, is that really number two? And when uh, Jordan looked at this closer, he found more weakly correlated to the calcium signal in the neighboring cells. So even if you just go one cell away, this correlation of the endocannabinoid it drops off precipitously. And, uh, and uh, when specificity that we see here when you compare the coupling of the calcium and um, is within the cell is, is higher and this um, neighbor um, specificity that we discussed here um, is, uh, is broken down. Uh, it's much less uh, spatially specific during seizure activity than during normal locomotion. Um, and 
So in the in the final part, I just want to kind of go back a little bit and talk a little bit about, so for seizures, therefore, what does this all mean? What should we hope for? You could say that, well, it's a great thing that, as we just mentioned here, that 2AG normally, when it gets synthesized as a result of increased neural activity, it inhibits further glutamate release. Um, and so therefore, uh, you know, it's a good thing, right, to have 2AG uh, during seizures, right? So the, maybe the more 2AG you have, the merrier. Now, interestingly, though, uh, Jordan has been uh, doing his um, graduate studies uh, at Calgary uh, with, uh, uh, with Cam Tasky. Uh, it was uh, his, uh, Cam was his uh, PhD advisor, and they figured out something super interesting. And I'm actually, I have to confess that uh, until Jordan came to my lab, I wasn't really aware of this, although they published it in 2016, but I find this super interesting for epilepsy research. And the basic idea is, it's not an idea they have shown is true, is that uh, during a seizure, what happens is that the um, blood vessels constrict, right? And you can see that physically, if you just look in the microscope, and that constriction lasts for tens of minutes after, uh, for example, a kindling-induced induced seizure. And if you put an oxygen sensor into the hippocampus, uh, you can see that there is a drop uh, of the uh, partial oxygen tension in the hippocampus below the 10 uh, millimeter mercury threshold that is supposed to be the severe hypoxic threshold. And they also showed that this process, they don't know what, how it happened, but it's COX-2 sensitive. So, um, and you'll get, you'll see why this is important. They used um, uh, acetam acetaminophen, um, but you can use other drugs as well. And you can prevent both the constriction of the blood vessel, as well as the um, drop in oxygen tension. And moreover, very importantly, when you have a seizure, an ictal event, and you get this tens of seconds long constriction, then what happens is that this leads to memory deficits, um, the LTP deficits, uh, as well as memory deficits in, in the behaving animals. And that can also be prevented by uh, the application of a COX-2 inhibitor. Now, came to my lab and involved in all these studies that I just showed you before, and he had this insight, and that's my last data slide. He had this insight that is it possible that since he, he was messing around with COX-2 in these in this processes um, that I just mentioned, so seizure, uh, constriction of blood vessels, hypoxia, memory deficit, uh, is it possible that COX-2, uh, which is baking down arachidonoic acid and converts it into Prostaglandins, PGE2. Um, is it possible that the arachidonoic acid that it breaks down is actually coming from 2AG? So we mentioned that 2AG is actually shortening the seizure duration. That's a good thing. But Jordan had this insight, which I thought was super novel and very innovative, is that could it be that 2AG has a, if you want, a genus phase, which is that too much 2-AG may actually underlie this postictal hypoxia. And as you can see here, while I was talking, indeed, that's what he found. So when um, in collaboration with Cam Tasky's lab, when um, we looked, um, messing around with this pathway here that's shown from seizures to 2-AG to, to arachidonic acid to PGA2 and um, endothelin uh, one receptors, you see that in each case, if you block this pathway, you can reduce the post-ictal uh, hypoxia. So uh, in conclusion, this new endocannabinoid sensor can measure, measure changes in endocannabinoids at timescales that are commensurate with the high liability of the lipid signals, which was not possible with conventional biochemical methods. I showed you that even during a seizure, the signal is back within a minute. We showed that it's 2-AG and not an endamide that is coupled to uh, hippocampal um, neuronal activity with high spatial temporal specificity. Seizures amplify the 2-AG synthesis, and the signaling becomes less uh, spatially specific. 
And we also showed that pathological 2-AG production during seizures shortens seizure duration, but leads to elevated prostaglandins and a stroke-like hypoxic uh, event. Um, and I just want to say that um, I am always extremely thankful to taxpayers and other funding agencies, uh, federal and private. And I just want to thank in particular NIH for funding uh, all of these studies, as well as the various fellowships that uh, people in my lab um, have uh, received. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, and I'm ready to take questions. Thanks Thank so you, much. Ivan. That's terrific. Uh, you broke up a little bit while you were talking about the spatial correlation of the calcium and endocannabinoid signals, but I think we 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 all got the message, uh, and and the sound was fine after that. Um, can I just before um, uh, throwing this open? Can I just jump in there and trying to link together the two halves of your talk? So, of course, you know the origin of the endocannabinoid signaling system uh, in the brain was very much focused on GABA release through the discovery of uh, the endocannabinoid mechanism underlying uh, DSI. Uh, but of course, the effects on the seizures that you're, you're describing um, is putting the emphasis more on the glutamate release. And I'm just wondering if uh, a very simple but sort of trivial explanation to is, is that the uh, CCK positive interneurons are quiet when, um, when at times when, for instance, during locomotion, and so, uh, the, so suppressing GABA release isn't going to have much effect, and so the main effect will be suppression of glutamate release. What we think. So, um, so it's it's very curious, right? That uh, you you know that you put that nature puts so much so many cannabinoid molecules. Oh, sorry, not going to be more CB1 receptor molecules on a single CCK cell terminal. It's something in the order of 800 per terminal, right? Um, and yet, the uh, when the cannabinoids are released, the CCK cells are actually not very active, right? So, it's a very interesting contradiction. Um, and obviously, we are just beginning to scratch the surface in trying to understand. Uh, what this is all about, but you're absolutely right. So um, the, uh, it's entirely uh, possible that during seizures, we actually don't know yet, we are, uh, Barna, that's what one of Barna's major um, goals is. He just got a K99 on this. Um, he's, by the way, looking for a job, both of them. Um, uh, so, um, so, they, um, so, so yes, yeah, so we don't know exactly what happens to the CCK basket selectivity during seizures, but it's to me, it's personally very satisfying that within my lifetime, we got this far, that we can actually look at this, both in terms of what happens to the CCK cells uh, during seizures and what happens to the endocannabinoid signal and, and really answer your questions. Question. So we've got a couple of questions. I think Christoph, you want to go ahead? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Ivan. As an Hi. honorary Hungarian, I feel entitled because I was chained to, to the neural Lucida uh, camera system <laughs> during my PhD. Yeah, we shared that fate. <laughs> yes, um, including using CB1 agonists during the drawings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, my question is, did you try to get some uh, mechanistic insight at the network level of this interplay between CCK and PV cells with your uh, uh, whole hippocampus uh, model to see how they could coordinate in relationship to the other uh, interneurons? And I have just a tiny question if I can add it. This X thing that you show between the PV and the, and the CCK, it's not like real an X or line. I see two inflection points on the PV response and on the CCK response. So I wonder whether you have looked at that. What are these inflection points in the rise or decrease of activity? Right, so yeah, so, um, so to answer the first question, we, we haven't yet looked at with, with computational uh, neuroscience at this. 
but we are looking at it. I actually have an excellent postdoc coming, who just graduated, uh, Alexandra from, uh, from uh, Francis Skinner's lab in Toronto. So she's going to join us in June and this will be one of her uh, projects. And she actually already Can she made this discoveries she didn't actually um, you know, she didn't uh, know about these data. So this is really now very ripe for computational analysis. You're absolutely right. So the answer is we, we don't know. And regarding that, uh, it's an interesting. Oh, Ivan, you're um, breaking up. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sitting right next to the router. So <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so, um, so basically, the regarding that inflection point. Um, well, I don't know. Um, what shall we do? You're you're coming and going. You're fading in and out. Oh, okay. Um, that's just the story of my life, Dimitri. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Shall I continue or? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can hear you now. Okay. Uh, so, so the short answer is we don't know the inflection point. What's the significance? Whether that we lost you again. No, I'm sorry. I think it's a secret. He does it on purpose not to reveal the secret. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, Christophe. <laughs> Yeah, anyways, if somebody's interested about this, I can answer it online. <laughs> okay, um, there's a question from Steve Danza. Steve, do you wanna go ahead? Uh, yeah, uh, hi, Ivan, can you hear me okay? So uh, I had a question. Uh, so with these new tools for labeling interneurons, uh, it seems like it becomes increasingly possible to address sort of a longstanding question of, of whether these interneuron populations are actually stable over time, or do they change, right? So, um, so you can imagine that, say, CCK neurons is born a CK, CCK neuron and stays that way uh, for the entire life of the cell, or do they are they able to turn it on and off? Can they express other interneuron markers under certain conditions? Is do you see any evidence for that? Do you have thoughts to look at that? Um, you know, um, we we haven't really looked at this. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, if maybe I can switch off my video if next time it happens, I just switch off my video. But anyway, Steve, so yeah, so we haven't looked at this, but yes, with this tool, you most definitely can, for example, look at the CCK interneuronal system over time, as you said, uh, for example, look at uh, through the process of epileptogenesis mm -hmm. in chronic epilepsy models. And exactly. Them up. So we are very interested in all of this. And uh, of course the whole, you know, we can't do everything. So we, you know, the, the, I think this is exciting for the entire field. Thank you. Yeah. A uh, question from Karen Wilcox. Hey, Yvonne, great talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. you can. All right, so gorgeous work. Um, so I really like the endocannabinoid indicator. And I was just curious with respect to Dimitri's comment about DSI and DSE, have you had a chance to look at that in the slices while using the indicator or too busy doing it in vivo and doing amazing stuff? <laughs> right, so, so, we, we, so my lab focused on uh, in vivo, um, but actually AO's paper on the indicator is out on the on a uh, bioarchive. Uh, so it's currently going under revision. Okay. But it's already the original version is on bioarchive if, if you wanna have a closer look. Um, and, uh, but the bottom line is that um, there are very super interesting things there that clearly we are just, you know, just getting a glimpse of. Like for example, AO has some evidence and it's in the paper that there could be some hotspots of, uh, of uh, glutamate release, uh, sorry, endocannabinoid uh, synthesis and release. So um, I shouldn't say really release because don't forget we, we have the sensor expressed on the cell membrane and we, we haven't actually looked at this issue of how do the endocannabinoids, you know, synthesize in one cell 
do they actually cross and, and attach themselves to another cell and things like that. But um, yeah, so this is all um, very interesting and we can uh, certainly uh, look at it further. Um, you know, the, the endocannabinoid system as a whole has many uh, puzzles. Like, you know, you mentioned what Dimitri was saying. Uh, so that's definitely one that the whole DSE, DSI issue. Uh, anatomically, it's, it's to me, it's, it's always been a huge puzzle. Why is it that the endocannabinoid, the 2AG synthesizing machinery is out in the dendrite of pyramid dendrites and spines, spine head mostly of CAO pyramids, whereas the, um, whereas the CCK basket cell terminals that have the most amounts of CB1 receptors are actually around the perisomatic region. So why would nature do this? That you have the synthesizing enzyme for a synthesizing for for cannabinoids up in the dendrites and the packs so many CB1 receptors at the uh, at the uh, perisynap uh, sorry at the at the soma uh, presynaptically on the CCK basket cell. So all of this is uh, is, is a puzzle. But I'm um, but I am very excited that now we can really, as a community, really start looking into this and, and really unravel this. Right, thanks. And question from Miriam Meisler. Yes, thank you for a beautiful talk. Thank I you. wondered if it's in the works that uh, they will make an SNCG Cree line to, that you can use with all the fluxed genes available in the mouse. Yes, yeah, so I don't know, uh, actually. I don't think so. I don't think that they are working on this particularly, um, but maybe they are. Um, and uh, the, you know, the, the, the flip line is actually working fine. And in, in a way for at, us, at least, it leaves open all the, you know, parallel, for parallel studies like we did, you know, SNCG with flip and anything with Cree like PV and others. Uh, so, so it, it works uh, very well um, this way too, but you're right, it would be nice to have a Cree line as well, but I don't know if anybody's actively working on it. Thank you. Thanks, Miriam. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you so much again, Ivan. That was absolutely fantastic. A pleasure. Um, lots of food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very much and for listening to me. It was fun. Great. Thank you so much again. Yep. See you uh, at the bar, guys. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry, I, I was just going to announce the next talk, but yeah. uh, Gabriela, do you have the details of the next talk? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the 21st of April and will be Massimo Mantegazza speaking about SN1A in a 1.1 sodium channel, loss and gain of function in epilepsy in migraine. All right. Well, farewell, everyone. Thanks once again to everybody for joining in and to Ivan for giving us a very stimulating talk. Thanks again. Bye. Bye, Ivan.